So in this video, I would like to talk about the natural history of myelodysplastic syndromes. Now, if we look at the word natural history, what we really mean is a description. So this is a description of the course that a particular disease, in this case MDS, will take over time. Now, we've said before in other videos that myelodysplastic syndromes, that the group of diseases, are very heterogeneous. They are very different in the way that they present and in the course that the different groups within MDS will follow. But as a general rule, we know that the great risks involved with MDS and the things that we can expect to happen over time, and I'll come back to this picture down here in a minute, is that patients will develop uh, increasing numbers and severity of cytopenias. So they usually start with, let's say, anemia, and then later they can develop other cytopenias, such as neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, and patients run a risk of developing acute myeloid leukemia. So if this purple, what I suggested here to be a road, represents the life of the patient from the point of diagnosis with MDS, so let's say uh, the patient is diagnosed here, that's for diagnosis with MDS, myelodysplastic syndrome, then there is a particular course that the disease may follow. So um, let's make this endpoint. We'll say this is death. Somewhere on this road, many things can happen. For instance, you can have, um, let's say, hills and valleys. This valley here may represent an infection, while this heal may pre represent successful treatment. So the patient became better after being given antibiotics. This here could be a bleeding episode. And with support, with uh, plate transfusion or otherwise, the patient improved again and is better. And often during, towards the end of the patient with MDS's life, they may develop acute myeloid leukemia. So the question is, is there any way to predict in any individual patient what the cause of this disease would be like? In other words, if a patient is diagnosed here, let's say in an early phase or an early stage of the disease, how many years of life is left? Or how much time is left until progression to AML. And there are specific parameters that we use, um, also called endpoints in many clinical studies, that tells us something about the course of the disease. The one would be overall survival. Now, overall survival could be given as a time. So in other words, if the patient is diagnosed here, we could estimate that he may have or he or she may have 10 years uh, to live or it could be a rate so we could say for instance um, if we have a hundred patients diagnosed with mds here let's say each of them represented by one of these dots if we have a hundred of them how many of them will still be alive at a five-year time point and that's often called something like five-year median survival, as an example. Another important endpoint to consider is progression-free survival. So if we think about progression in MDS, we can think about progression to AML, acute myeloid leukemia, mentioned here, so this one there, or we can think of progression to complete bone marrow failure. And this could be another way to express the course of this, the disease. The question now is the, the patient sitting in front of you. Let's, let's give that patient another color. Let's say there's this patient here in blue sitting in front of you, this little one here, and this patient wants to know what is my overall survival or what is my progression-free survival. Now to give an answer 
that would be accurate for an individual patient is almost impossible. And I think it's important to recognize it. The only thing we can do is make an estimation. And this estimation, we must remember, would be based on, a, on studies that were done with a large group of patients that were similar to the patient sitting in front of you. But every patient may have individual characteristics that could influence the survival or the, the overall survival or progression-free survival. For instance, if the patient has comorbid disease, such as heart disease or lung disease, that may have an influence on the survival independent of the MDS. But there may also be MDS-related factors that could have an effect on survival. And it's these MDS-related factors that can often help us greatly. So, for instance, um, we can look at patients over time and say that some patients only survive one year while others survive 10 years or 20 years and try to determine what factors affected that difference. And we know now that there are a number of prognostic factors such as the blast percentage in the bone marrow as well as things like chromosomal abnormalities as me measured by cytogenetics in the MDS uh, related cells. We can look at the depth and the number of cytopenias, things like transfusion, let's just say TF transfusion dependency, or perhaps iron overload, which is often uh, due to transfusion but could also be there due to other reasons. Now, all these factors and many, many others have been identified as having a negative impact on prognosis. So these factors could decrease overall survival and sometimes decrease progression-free survival. But each one of them may contribute to a risk for progression or a risk of not living as long as their normal counterparts uh, in a different way. So some factors, a high blast percentage, may for instance count much more than a patient who only has anemia, as, a, as, as an example. And in a similar way, each of these is weighted differently. So what has been done is that a number of so-called prognostic scoring systems have been developed that take into account the relative weighting of different factors, not only these, many others as well. And then when put together, you can make an estimation of what the outcome of a particular patient would be. And examples of that would be the International Prognostic Scoring System, the World Health Organization Prognostic Scoring System, or for instance, the re more recent um, IPSSR, which is the revised Inter International Prognostic Scoring System. And with this one being done and looked at on, on more than 7,000 patients, um, I think this one will become the, the new standard in the foreseeable future. So how can these things help us? Let's, let's just look at it for a moment. So if we have this group of patients, all of them with a similar type of MDS, then we could say, okay, some of them, some of them will live very, very long, while others will only have a very short survival, and then there will be more of them that will be intermediate, and some of them that will be there. And what the IPS is does, or the IPSSR, or any of these prognostic scoring systems, they basically tell us that at diagnosis, how far would the average patient in that group be from transforming to acute myeloid leukemia or from death? So for instance, 
with the IPSSR, we could find that there are five different groups. There would be a low risk group, and then, or a very low risk group, let's say very low here, very low, a low risk group, then there may be an intermediate group, a high risk group, and a very, very high risk group. And this basically gives the patient a better idea of where they find themselves on this timeline. So for instance, a patient in the very high risk group here has a very, very high risk to get to AML to this time point and may also be close to, uh, to death. And therefore, this is actually also very important because this will help us in our decision on how we should treat and manage the patient. Because if we think of treatment and of what we are doing here, well, if we're walking a road with a patient, there are a few things that we want to do. One is, and this is very important, we want to support the patient. And this is, is basically true for all patients, but will be the mainstay of, of treatment in the earlier um, you know, the, the very low and low risk patients where we will give supportive care such as transfusions or chelation therapy to remove the iron. Um, we may give erythropoietin, EPO, etc, etc. But there's also something else that we may want to cons consider and that is could we alter the natural history of the disease? In other words, if the patient happens to find him or herself here at this time point at a very high risk point, close to AML, close to death. Could we move this patient back in time to a place where they are perhaps at high risk or intermediate risk? Can we take the patient back? Well, to do that, we must do a few things. Well, we can, the one is we can treat the underlying disease, try to cure the MDS. Well, if you cure the MDS, fantastic, then you may have very little impact on the patient's survival. For instance, if you give a stem cell transplantation. Or we need certain chemotherapies or other medications that may increase survival and move the patient back on the road and give them a longer piece of road, if you want to see it that way, to, to walk still until um, they go the way of all humans to death. So. Supportive care is very important to improve quality of life, but altering the natural history may not only include treating the underlying disease, it may also mean that you will remove reversible risk factors. So that's another way, reversible risk factors. So if you have any of these factors that you could reverse, a good example would be iron overload. There are a number of iron chelation therapies around that could remove the iron, and we know that the iron has an impact on overall survival. So if we remove the iron, there's a good chance that the patient may survive much longer. And in a similar way, we would like to find treatments for every possible reversible factor and try to change the course of this patient's disease. So in summary, I think it is important to understand that the natural history of any disease is an important description that helps us to give our patient information on what they can expect. Secondly, it helps us estimate how long they have to live, how long they have to AML, and that will help us decide on which treatments to give. And most of the current guidelines that tell us what to do actually refer back to these things exactly. So what category does the patient fall in? and that will tell us um, what treatments to give. What I haven't mentioned yet is the importance of classifying the disease. Let's just put classify there, because there are some individual subtypes of disease. For instance, um, MDS with the 5Q minus syndrome that may require very specific therapy that could help, for instance, lenalidomide, that could dramatically alter the patient's natural course of disease and decreased transfusion requirements, etc. So you want to classify the patient, you want to estimate the prognosis so that you can advise the patient, decide on treatment, and these things also help us
to um, make deductions from clinical trials when we want to evaluate new therapies. And this will be very helpful for you to understand when you read clinical trials. What do we mean if we say a particular drug led to a better overall survival or a better pro uh, progression-free survival uh, when you want to make a decision on whether that drug is worth trying.